Hey everyone, welcome to the UFO Hub live stream. Uh, today's guest is going to be David Marler, and we'll be talking about triangular UFOs. I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly the full title, but uh, you guys will figure it out throughout, I'm sure. Um, so what I wanted to make a quick announcement before we get to, to uh, David and uh, get started. Um, I did officially pick a winner. Uh, last Wednesday, I announced that, um, uh, let me see a time is a human construct. That is the name of the channel that uh, left the hashtag and the rand random algorithm picked them to win the two tickets uh, for the conference. So I'm hoping uh, that they'll still get back to me. I left them a comment. Um, I also was, uh, let me, let me switch this over. So if in case they're watching, they see what I'm referring to. Um, under their about page, uh, there's no email. And in order for me to know exactly that, that that's the right person, um, I would appreciate them leaving an email that I can write them to and give them further directions of how to claim their tickets. So initially I said three days, but I figured I'll give it over the weekend, hoping uh, that they would get back to me or update their page. Otherwise, unfortunately, I'm going to have to move on and then uh, pick uh, another winner that had um, submitted to hopefully win. So, um, so anyway, regarding that, uh, I'm sorry, the tickets are no longer available, but you can still uh, go to um, OzarkUFOConference.com and register. Uh, you can either live stream it or, or we hope you can make it in person. And um, it would be in Eureka Springs, uh, I think, yeah, April 8th till 10th. Forgot that for a second. And um, I think that's pretty much it. That covers all the, the homework part. Let me get back here. But um, this new guest uh, or this new guest to the old UFO Hub live stream, I haven't uh, had him on this platform before. I, I believe I interviewed him twice before. And this was uh, both times in Eureka Springs. And I was always happy to, to talk to him one time. It was very much about uh, a different aspect about triangular UFOs. Second time was about the Battle of LA. And I think it was an anniversary. What year it is, I do not know. So you guys know I'm always a horrible host. So don't blame me for it. But <clears throat> let me switch this over. So with uh, Without any further ado, let me uh, bring in uh, David. Uh, welcome, David. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's great to be with you again. All right. Well, I'm I'm glad uh, we're able to uh, to get this going and and uh, make this happen. So, um, I figured just again, like uh, even though I have uh, videos about this guest, you know, often and um, uh, some people might know them, not everyone knows about you. So I was wondering if you could maybe just start out a little bit with with your background, and then uh, we'll start out with the questions after that. Sure. Um, well, I've been actively involved in UFO research since 1990. Uh, I've had an interest since I was a kid in the subject, but it wasn't until 1990 I became actively involved in reading, researching, learning about the subject, and ultimately investigating the subject. Uh, I started with uh, MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. I uh, lived in Illinois at the time and uh, worked my way up the ranks to Illinois State Director, which I did for about seven or eight years. Uh, conducted a lot of investigations during that time, and uh, during the course of those years, started amassing what was uh, then a very small library, and now it's developed into a huge research library slash center where I'm happy to share information with not only public audiences across the country, but with fellow researchers and uh, enthusiasts with regard to the UFO subject. So, David, uh, I assume, is that the, the, the uh, library you amassed behind you? Is that... Uh... It is, yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it, in the dark shadows there behind me uh, lurks the, the file cabinets and the bookcases, microfilm, audio recordings, um, and it's just a, a constant uh, a piece of work. Um, as I always like to say, it's not a static collection. It's not the same stuff that was here last year or the year before. In fact, just within the last few weeks, I received uh, two large boxes of historic audio recordings, both on cassette and reel-to-reel, -reel, large reel-to-reel -reel, uh, recordings uh, dating back to the 1950s. And I work and network with a lot of UFO researchers and historians. That particular collection came from my friend Rod Dyke in Seattle, Washington. And during COVID, uh, we all have stories about what we've been doing during COVID. Uh, during COVID, I actually digitized 221 historic audio recordings going back as early as 1957. 
And in addition to that, uh, I've been working on historical case files, which I uh, acquired in November of 2020. And those involve the historic NICAP, National Investigation Committee on Aerial Phenomenon, as well as Center for UFO Studies or CUFOS case files, and many, many other collections that, that are kind of under that umbrella. And I've been going through all of those case files the last uh, calendar year, looking specifically at triangular UFO reports that go back to the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. And I found a whole new subset of uh, case files pertaining to triangular UFOs that I did not have when I wrote my book in 2013. And so, uh, as I say, it, it, it's new historical cases and validated insights because what I found in those case files that have, by the way, I must mention, never been seen by the general public until the conference coming up in Eureka Springs, I found the same characteristics that I outlined in my book in 2013 based on the historic subset of data I had at that time. And so it truly is validating for what I've written about the subject. And we're going to go into those case files, look at the descriptions. And in fact, we'll also be hearing from some of the witnesses. Many of the historic case files had audio recordings, which I digitized. And so the audience will see the sketches, see the written reports, but also hear from some of the witnesses describing what they saw. You know, I'm definitely not on my A game today. Uh, out of everything I could have mentioned, I was like, David is a keynote speaker there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, you know, um, you've been speaking at that conference for quite a while because I remember a few years back when we were trying to do a, um, or at least I should say Ozark uh, uh, publishing, when they were trying to do a kind of like a, um, oh, what is it called? Um, like a tribute to people that have been coming to conferences for years and, and years. Sure. Um, there was, I believe, a specifically a video of you, and uh, it was funny, you kind of like got on stage looking around at the lights, and, you know, it seems like, honestly, to me, maybe other people don't see it, you still have that same spunk and energy that you did then. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, if I remember the video clip you're referring to, that was actually from April of 2000, which staggers the mind for, I'm sure, you and many of the audience members that, that are watching this, uh, thinking that that was 22 years ago that, that we had that conference. And that was the first public lecture I ever gave. And that was at the request of uh, Lou Farish, who, of course, uh, conducted the conferences for many, many years before Dolores Cannon took it over. And uh, it was uh, I was extremely nervous. I think I was about ready to throw up, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> but in 22 years, I'd like to think that I've gotten more comfortable and, and been able to hone my my uh, public speaking skills to some degree. But also, more importantly, have really started to develop a rich history of the phenomenon and being able to share that. And that's something I'd like to mention before I forget. I always say uh, at, at public lectures and I'll say it here. I can collect all this historic information. I can put it together into a presentable form. But if it isn't for the uh, Ozark Mountain UFO Conference in Eureka Springs and other venues, what's the point? We need to have a vehicle by which we can share this information. And I just want to thank you and the, the conference organizers for giving us that platform to share the information with people that, that are interested just as much, if not more, than myself in the subject matter. Well, you know, one great thing, especially for those that are still very much, you know, into uh, um, nuts and bolts, and I don't mean that in negative ways, just, yes, you know, in sure. this field, there's people that are into every aspect of, of ufology. And so, uh, especially when you did the presentation about uh, Battle in LA, there's some things that I didn't even know about. So I'm, I'm really <laughs> glad. Well, because I went downstairs and I was going to take some pictures, and then you had like newspaper cutouts and what was actually printed during that time. And there was like not just one, but like five or six of them. You know, they were all over the place. I was like, if that's not research, I don't know what is. Well, thank you. And in fact, someone remarked at the, at the conference that year that, uh, you know, not only do you cite your references, you actually bring the references for us to see. And so it was really nice to see people get a get a kick out of a, a case from 1942 and to be able to see, you know, their enthusiasm and their interest. And that's what I try to do is not only present history, but breathe life into it. And so as I get older, that spunk that you referred to, I think is dwindling, but I'd like, <laughs> it's nice that it's nice that I apparently still have a little bit of it to, uh, to share with the audience. 
Right. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't want to necessarily just make this interview about that spe uh, specific event, but there's a difference between what we kind of speculate about what was done and there's people that always tell stories. And it's totally different that those things that should be in conspiratorial uh, realms or generally are, they were on the newspaper. <laughs> that's, what's so, that's, that's what's so beautiful about that kind of research to where you go like, oh, this wasn't just some kind of crazy crazy person saying that it's like they actually shot at this thing absolutely absolutely and what we're hopefully going to see uh in april with my new presentation on triangular ufo historical cases uh are are is the sincerity and the details in these new case files if i new old case files if i can call them that again many of these date back to uh, the late 40s early 50s and again, what I wanted to do, my goal was for this year's presentation is I've talked about my archive. I've talked about the research that I do and the information I collect. Short of bringing everybody here to the archive, what I want to do is bring the archive to the audience. And so, again, we're not going to look at one case. We're going to do a systematic overview of decades worth of case files, but more specifically, looking at the sketches, the written descriptions, he, again, hearing the audio recordings of the witnesses. And what you're going to see is what I've seen, that these people are essentially reporting the same thing. Now, we could say that today about triangular reports, but the important thing that we have to understand is the time frame that we're going to be looking at. Respectfully, we'll be looking from 1947 to 1977. And the reason that I, I, I start there is uh, this year is the 75th anniversary of the modern age of UFOs. It was, you know, 75 years ago coming this June that Kenneth Arnold was misquoted as, as saying flying saucer. So I start there and I go to 1977. And the reason I do that, and I'll discuss this in my lecture, there is a UK uh, UFO researcher that in a documentary that I was on made a comment that, well, these triangles didn't really start appearing until 1977. And that just happened to coincide with the movie Star Wars. And what he implied was that due to cultural influences, people saw Star Wars in 1977. They saw this triangular Star Destroyer, and that shaped the narrative for people moving forward reporting UFOs. In other words, they were looking up thinking they were seeing triangles. Again, as I have often said in the subject, and this applies to me as well as everyone listening, it doesn't matter what you believe regarding the UFO subject if the data doesn't support that belief or if the data is completely contradictory to that belief. And what I do is I show prior to 1977 with the release of Star Wars, going back to 47, just in this new set of historical case files that I've received, which by the way, is the largest single historical collection of case files, which I have housed here, I have found over 102 triangular UFO reports. These were filed at a time in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and even early to mid 70s, when the classic report was that of a flying saucer. So if people wanted to concoct or orchestrate or hoax a UFO report, you think that they would describe a 30-foot silver shiny disc. But in these particular cases, and we're only going to look at a portion of those 102, obviously due to time constraints, what you find is they're describing the triangles that we're getting reports of today. And I use that as kind of a linchpin in an argument that many people think that all of these triangles that are being reported today are top secret military aircraft. How can you use that as a blanket explanation? And I do concede that some triangles today might be military. I, I certainly don't rule that out as a possibility. But when you start looking back at the 1970s, 60s, 50s, 40s, how long are we going to cling to this belief that this is some top secret exotic military aircraft that has yet to be officially unveiled? Um, I personally feel that that's a revisionist history bordering on the delusional to think that we had this exotic technology that many decades ago, yet we've spent billions of dollars on inferior technologies like, you know, uh, Navy Tomcat fighters and stealth fighters and stealth bombers. Um, I think that the historical argument shows there's a history worldwide of these things being reported that go way before stealth technology as we know it. 
which is suggestive, not conclusive, but suggestive that this is someone else's technology in many of these cases. You know, David, uh, prior to doing UFO Hub and um, doing just when I first started out uh, my research, there's no other, um, I guess, I don't know if I should say no other shape than the triangle of UFOs that really captures most people's attention and talk about the most. You know, maybe because it's not conventional, maybe because it's there's nothing aerodynamic about it, you know, um, or at least that I don't know of, because would, you would think it'd be if it's in the sky or just plop down to the ground. You know, at least when you say a disc, well, it can kind of glide down, right? If it has some kind sure. of wings, you know, you can assume that, okay, you know, it'll land but maybe just to know that something like that has been observed and that it flew uh, it gets the attention in in ways like no other so i hate to well not not wanting to go to that direction but do you think that um the the for example like a lot of them uh, uh do say okay this could be military is that like more like a leaked rumor or a, or just a rumor period that was just made up or do you do you have some documents or data that can back that up that it could potentially also be military for real well we don't have any official documentation that i've seen or i've been privy to to suggest that we do have any type of aircraft or vehicle like this uh, really when you look back at the history of the this uh, you know military explanation it usually is hinged on one man's testimony that goes back to the 1990s. His name was Edgar Fouché, and he claimed to work at Area 51. He claimed to be involved in these compartmentalized classified projects, and he claims that they had a vehicle that looks very similar to the triangular UFOs that we're having reported both then and now. Um, and he states that it's called the TR-3B. And he gives you all this fanciful physics that he put out at the time saying this is how they fly and this is how they operate. And quite literally, and, and I can't emphasize this enough, it literally hinges on his statements. He has nothing to back it up. He has no documentation. He has no valid evidence of any kind to support the story that he gave at the time. And that has just continued to grow and I was remarking to a European researcher just the other day that it, it's become this pervasive urban myth within the UFO field that people will see video of a triangular UFO and you'll see this uh, ever-present comment on YouTube or elsewhere, oh, it's just the TR-3B, like we know for a fact that it exists. Right. The fact of the matter is we don't. It is, again... A story based on one man's testimony. Unfortunately, Edgar Fouché passed away some years ago, so we can't sit him down and really conduct an in-depth interview. Um, but I like to make a distinction here, if I might. People state, well, I believe some of these triangles might be military. I'm willing to go down that path, but we have no evidence to support it. But I'm willing to accept that as a, a definite possibility for some of the more modern day accounts. That being said, I'm not going to use the term TR-3B because for those that use the term TR-3B, it implies that you believe the entire story told by Edgar Fouché, and I don't. So whereas uh, it's not semantics, it's it, the devil's in the details, I can see that there might be triangular aircraft that have exotic flight characteristics that people might be seeing today, but I'm not going to use the nomenclature of TR-3B because in saying that, I'm endorsing the claims made by this man who has no evidence to back it up. I see. So, David, without getting into too much detail, but whatever it is that you can talk about, um, can you go a little bit about uh, some of the, some of the, I guess, new things about uh, the triangular UFOs that you've discovered? Absolutely. Uh, again, uh, it's not so much new things, but validated insights regarding these cases. Um, uh, for those that have read my book or maybe attended some of my previous lectures, some of the characteristics that we see, and, and, and you ref referenced the triangle not being aerodynamic necessarily, we do have triangular aircraft, delta wing aircraft, that, that do fly and are aerodynamic in nature. One of the most unusual characteristics, exotic characteristics with many of these reports, and I documented this in my book and I've shown previous examples, but guess what? In the NICAP and KUFOS case files uh, going back into the early 1950s, we have reports of the triangles moving with the flat side as the leading edge. In other words, mm. if you think aerodynamics, you think the point of an aircraft would be the leading edge. 
a number of these, and we have really great sketches by some of these witnesses, which I'm going to be sharing with audience members. Another reason I really love showing the actual case files themselves. You see the, the triangle, and you'll see arrows indicating the direction of movement. In fact, one of the audios I have is from 1964 in Pennsylvania, where they were having a wave of UFO sightings at that time. And uh, luckily, in digitizing the tapes, I recognize that this case was one that I had recently digitized for inclusion in my lecture. And sure enough, uh, here's the written eyewitness testimony, and here's the recording of the interview from 1964. And the witness stated the most defined characteristic of the triangle that he, he and a friend observed was this long, broad edge that was the leading edge. And sure enough, you'll see his sketch showing this flat side and then how it tapers down. It was essentially an isosceles triangle. And in the audio recording, he says, well, he goes, it was really strange. He goes, it was this flat side that was the leading edge. And then it kind of tapered off to a point, but that was the leading edge. And when you see that in conjunction with the cases that I've outlined in my book and that I've lectured on previously, it just shows you this consistent pattern of reporting. And something we have to remember, again, going back to 64, just taking this one case, for example, most people didn't even know there were other reports of triangles at the time. Most UFO researchers didn't know that there was this smaller subset of UFO reports that were triangular. And then certainly when we got into the 70s and the 80s, the triangular UFOs did increase in frequency. And um, I know we're going to have uh, Cheryl Costa presenting her statistical work at the conference, and I'm sure she'll be touching on some of this. Uh, she provides really great insights looking at the statistics because, again, we can sit here and say something is prevalent, but, you know, someone like Cheryl, who I respect highly, she's going to show you the numbers, the statistics to back it up. And so I think uh, be, be between her statistics and my in-depth analysis of some of these cases, I, I think it's going to be a really rich and hopefully educational and entertaining experience at the conference. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it's always nice to just kind of um, have some kind of correlation. At least um, I know you, at least as far as I know, you guys didn't coordinate it. So it'll work out great <laughs> for you representing that and then her doing that. Because uh, she, 2019, um, it was like the first time I've seen somebody represent data and it not be boring. <laughs> you know? No, absolutely. And I've remarked to Cheryl, we've attended other conferences and I've told her, I said, I'm so glad you're doing this work because with all due respect, statistics was my worst class in college. <laughs> right. so it is not my strong point. So, right. and you know, that's what's wonderful about the conference also is that everyone brings something to the table and it might be an area of specialty. Mine is doing analysis and looking at the history and providing historical context for what's being reported today and having someone that looks at statistics. And I know we're going to have a couple great speakers uh, that are going to talk about the high strangeness beyond nuts and bolts. Yeah, Ray so Hernandez, they're too. Bring, they're, they're going to be bringing it, Ray Hernandez as well as John Alexander. They're going to be touching on those high strangeness elements and consciousness. And so we each have a piece of the puzzle is how I like to look at it. One is no more or less important, but when we all come together and we can present this information, I think that really fuels the, you know, the mental juices for the audience that's going to be able to sit there and, and hear this information. Hopefully it all coalesces and eventually putting all that information together, we may start getting insights and insights may eventually lead to answers to this phenomenon. Right. Well, so, um, I want to just make a quick comment because uh, there's a question that came in from from somebody that I actually was thinking about asking, but I figured I'd get it over with now, and it'll give me an opportunity to let everyone else know. Um, sure. In about 20 minutes, we're going to do a Q&A with David, so you can submit your question in the chat, whether you're watching this on Twitch or on YouTube. Please make sure to put three asterisks before your question so it pops out at me, and I know it's not just uh, the regular chatter that you guys do amongst each other. And then also, of course, um, in the description below, you'll find a link to the uh, Telegram voice chat going on right now, and you can join it as well. And then uh, also uh, ask a question directly of David um, if you if you prefer. If not, simple submission of of the um, a question in the chat will be just fine. And the question was uh, basically about uh, this is from uh, Sonia. What is it specifically about? 
triangle UFOs? Was it was it the sheer amount of things that just happened to come your way, uh, or or just your own interest that got you to even then write a book about triangle UFOs? What, what specifically about that got your interest? It's a great question, Sonia. So when I became involved in UFOs, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, around 1990, there were uh, two or three hot topics within the UFO field at the time, one of which was uh, this wave of sightings of these large triangular platforms, aerial platforms that were being reported in Belgium. And I thought that the descriptions were highly intriguing. Angles are what I call unambiguous UFO Oh, David, I'm sorry, you just cut out, you cut out for, uh, for oh. about maybe three seconds. Um, you said descriptions oh, and then you cut out. One more time, please. Oh, sure. I was intrigued by the descriptions of these triangular UFOs because they were highly detailed in nature. The number of witnesses, the credibility of the witnesses, military personnel, the gendarmes or police officers in Belgium. And so that started my interest from an academic standpoint. And I continued to kind of follow the triangular UFO reporting uh, really from uh, 1990 up until 2000. And then, as I like to say, in 2000, as Illinois State Director, I investigated what is now kind of a landmark case in southern Illinois involving a very similar triangular UFO reported by multiple police officers that uh, described the shape, lighting characteristics and flight dynamics that paralleled or matched what had been reported 10 years prior in Belgium. So that kind of got my mind thinking, if there's parallels between these two highly detailed, credible, documented sightings, what other parallels might exist in the data? So that led me into, uh, rather naively, uh, and a, uh, kind of a cursory review of UFO reports in history. And what I found was consistency in these triangles being reported worldwide over decades and the same characteristics being reported time and time again, again, especially in the early years at a time when triangles weren't widely reported. So it's not like someone could readily read about this in any UFO book they picked up and then concoct a copycat report. And so it was just following the data, kind of following that trail of breadcrumbs, one case to another. And then now having the NICAP and KUFOS case files, which I failed to mention, I also have sitting here next to me, uh, Dr. J. Allen Hynek's original project Blue Book files. And those are very interesting. And we'll touch on one particular case, which really uh, raised the eyebrows for Dr. Hynek as it relates to triangular UFOs. But hopefully that answers your question. You know, uh, sadly, it was the show that when it uh, when it came out, I forgot on which which network about Blue Book Project Blue Book and and yes. um, uh, um, Alan Hynek that it got my, um, I guess, made me more aware how important it was to the field. You know, I, I yeah. felt kind of silly not knowing that ahead of time, you know, because everyone kind of starts out in their own research. And then only later do you find all these other, you know, people that were been doing this for years. And you're like, oh. Okay. Sure. <laughs> um, Absolutely. No, please go I ahead. Gonna I was just going to mention briefly, uh, the Project Blue Book material uh, is out in the public domain online and elsewhere. But what's unique about the files here, uh, and this goes back even into the early years, into the, the early 50s, you get to see not only the case files, but Dr. Hynek's handwritten notes where he would take complete contradictory viewpoints on a case uh, relative to the Air Force explanation. And you see him cross out where they say plasma or ball lightning, and he'll draw a line through it and then write unidentified and underline it three times. And then you'll quite often see little marginalia written. Why didn't the Air Force obtain radar data in this case? Why didn't... You get to see this um, angst, if you will, the frustration that he was dealing with, with the Air Force's take on the UFO subject. Um, so, sorry, for some reason, um, uh, you, again, it was like just for a split second, it was like maybe three seconds that you just kind of paused on us. Uh, for audio and video wasn't coming through, but I think we got the gist sure. of it. Um, yeah, okay. the connection is clean and, and great. Otherwise, I don't know why it's happening, but we'll, we'll, work, yeah. we'll work through it. <laughs> um, so... Regarding uh, now moving forward and, you, you know, 
you have established, you know, yourself in this field and and what it is and how you present the data and what it is that you do. Um, what kind of interests, if any, that you can share of all these other more governmental, higher level groups that, if I'm not mistaken, have then kind of noticed you? What is it specifically that about your research that interests them? Well, uh, specifically, uh, you know, I, I can mention Chris Mellon, who's been on uh, a number of different productions and documentaries with me. Uh, Chris and I c still continue to share information. I think it just really comes down to the fact that, uh, and this kind of echoes what I've heard from audiences uh, across the country over the years, I think people respect the fact that I'm showing you documented information, contemporaneous reports going back decades. I'm not simply giving you a story and not citing my references. I'm telling you the newspaper it came from. I'm telling you the government records group it came from. I'm citing my resources, which, you know, when I was going to college, that was uh, Research 101, always cite your references. Unfortunately, uh, and your audience may acknowledge this with, with other individuals, there's many people in the UFO field that spout off stories or will go down conspiracy trails and, and tell you these things but they can't tie it to anything. They can't cite, well, this is where I got it, or this is the document dated from this time period that says this, or here's the newspaper account. I really try to respect my audience by providing you the sources by which I'm deriving this information. And I do that for two reasons. One, you feel free to please fact check me, but also I provide it in the hopes that people will take the information that I'm putting out, grab that, go to those sources, and then take it even further, you know, feel free to show me up by taking that research to the whole new level. And I, I hope that I can serve as kind of an inspiration for for young researchers. I was just talking to a gentleman who just recently got involved in the field and he was asking my guidance on uh, how to do research and where should I go and how do I do this? And so since the New York Times article in December 2017 and, and more recently last year with the Pentagon UAP report, there's a whole new generation of people getting interested in the subject. And I've had people approach me. Uh, and it's just so exciting to see people coming in with a fresh set of eyes to look at the data, to look at the history. And as I always like to say, the more brains and the more sets of eyes we have looking at the data, the better we're going to be armed and prepared to try to tackle this subject and maybe find insights and maybe ultimately some answers to the subject matter. You know, I certainly appreciate that when, when there's new interest and people kind of pursue things on their own. I've often said on the, on this show, and I don't, I want, this is what I want to, um, you know, come back around to you regarding this specific, um, I guess I call it sometimes a problem, but so I always tell them, I said, you know, I'm glad you're watching your for hub but most people that know why I do UFO Hub, they know also the reason why I started it. And and uh, my, although I just uh, wish to provide information to people, I want them to take it and then do something with it, right? To help them out in some way. If I say, well, uh, try taking steps A, B, and C, and D, right? Um, to actually then, you know, see if that actually works for you too, you know, as, as it did for me. And so sometimes it drives me nuts when they come back and they'll be like, well, man, it's the next show. Well, it's the next show. I'm like, but then you're just using this for entertainment purposes, which I guess it's fine. <laughs> but do you ever sure. get irked? I guess if that's the right word to people say, well, David, what's next for you? What what what's the next great big book you're gonna write or or tell us something oh. about something new? Does that ever drive you nuts about? Well, why didn't you look into this yourself? Well, it, yes and no. I mean, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, certainly when people are asking, you know, what are you working on next or, you know, what's your next book on? I mean, that's certainly, you know, one of the highest compliments that they're interested enough to ask you that question. Um, but no, uh, I uh, in giving my lectures on different subjects, not just triangular UFOs, quite often uh, in the lectures I've given, there was one in Phoenix where I was talking about the Battle of L.A. and my research on that that we were discussing earlier. And someone said, did you ever think about accessing this government records group? And it was one that I didn't mention in my lecture. And when people suggest, well, did you ever think about looking at this or did you ever think about researching this? I always turn the question around on the individual asking the question. I said, well, no, I've gone through the Army records. But if you want to go through the Naval records, I would highly encourage you to do that. And maybe in the next year or two, you can come back and tell us what your findings are. Mm. So 
you know, I can't do it all. Right, I right. always like to say, I don't do this for a living. I don't, I have only written one UFO book. I don't write UFO books, uh, as a cottage industry. Uh, I have a successful career. I have a family and in my spare time, uh, I, I try to do as much UFO research and archiving and historical preservation as possible, but I can't do it alone. Even if I was doing it full time, I can't do it alone. And admittedly, and it's sad to say, having attended the Eureka Springs conference for so many years, many of the researchers that I used to attend their lectures have since passed on. Mm -hmm. And many of my colleagues that are older than me have passed on. And unfortunately, we don't see a lot of people that are younger filling those shoes and, you know, taking the baton and, and then running with it and conducting research into the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. So, you know, if, if, if not myself, if my other fellow speakers at the conference can serve as inspiration for the younger generation to start becoming actively involved in the subject, I think that's just a great thing. Yeah, no, but certainly, certainly, you know, and, um, but, you know, you, you, at, the, at the same time, I guess there's, there was always just this hope, you know, left us like may, maybe someone would be like, wow, you know, I can, I can go and do something, you know, and, and, and figure something else. Well, the more eyes you have, because, look, you know, it's a lot easier, you know, for a larger group, people all over the country, all over the world, to they collect these different pieces that could be useful, as opposed to one person trying to have to travel here and then go back there and then go across the world somewhere else. You know, it would be a lot easier just to collect that, connect those dots, you know, that way by just having more as part of the group. Well, and I will say since COVID and since I was uh, last in Eureka Springs, um, I've been involved in a number of very, you know, high quality productions. Uh, you know, the History Channel's Unidentified TV series. I, I was featured on that. We had an episode specifically dedicated to triangles. And then I worked with Ross Colthart, uh, one of the leading journalists in Australia, for his uh, documentary film, The Phenomenon, and also James Fox's documentary by the same name, The Phenomenon. But as a result of that and the worldwide exposure, just touching on what you just referenced, I have established in just the last two or three years more international connections with individuals, groups, and researchers uh, across the globe. And we're starting that international dialogue to a level that I never, ever thought I would ever attain. And I'm working right now with a gentleman in Wales who's doing a documentary on uh, a famous triangle uh, case in Wales that occurred in, in, back in the early 80s. Uh, there's a gentleman in the Netherlands who's doing a documentary currently on a famous military sighting of a triangular UFO. And so there's a lot going on globally that quite often we don't hear about. But in networking with those individuals, I'm providing material to provide historical context. They're sharing information with me. And who's to say in another year or two or three, I might be able to share some of their information here in the United States. It's just that international exchange. I'll also be on a virtual global uh, international panel based out of Brazil uh, later this summer. And I'm really looking forward to that opportunity. We'll have representatives from Portugal, Brazil, Canada, the UK, and uh, two or three other countries across the globe. And so not only do we have a new generation forming, but we, we, we're we starting to see this just burgeoning international level of cooperation and information sharing. And again, I, I don't think we can, you, you can never have enough data, as I always like to say. And so having that international exchange of information and ideas with people from all walks of life, from various uh, countries across the globe, it's kind of what I dreamed about, to be quite honest. I always used to say when I was very early in this subject, uh, we need to have the United Nations of ufology where we can all come together and share information. And in a loose, informal sort of way, I think we're starting to see that uh, continue to develop. So, David, um, I would like to then go into uh, question and answers next, but uh, just so I sure. give everyone enough time since I just now sprung it on them that we're starting this. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to ask you a question, and I hope they take that opportunity to uh, submit the question. So, um, 
all of you watching, if you have a question for David now uh, in the chat, please uh, put three asterisks, asterisks um, I can't speak today, asterisks before your question. If you're on Telegram, please raise your hand so I can add you to my queue. And so that way I'll um, already have some questions lined up for David after I ask this particular one. So David, we already kind of, um, or you mentioned it regarding this, you know, a, a lot of times um, people always want to say that the government doesn't know, want people to know about certain things about ufology and that they'll put out enough, you know, a lot of misinformation out there. But uh, just sort of kind of in this uh, uh, TR3B example, sometimes it's the very people that are into this field that are also being the counterproductive party, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, sure. Do you find that that's a huge hindrance or do you think that the, the guys that really, you know, put in the work to figure out exactly what's going on, that they're not going to be hindered by those types in the field? Well, it is frustrating. And I think earlier you mentioned the angst that I sometimes, you know, get with certain things. And that's one of the, the biggest issues that I have. Admittedly, the United States government over the years has put out misleading information, misinformation, disinformation. Uh, again, the blue book files I have right here where they have explanations that are just factually inaccurate. It simply doesn't fit the facts. Or if the, the, the planet or constellation they're saying was an explanation for the sighting, and well, it, it wasn't visible at that part of the country at that, at, at that time of night. Uh, so there's demonstrable cases where clearly they were just putting out false information. Um, the, the most frustrating thing, though, I think I have with regard to the subject is when we have seemingly well-meaning UFO researchers out there that are putting forth and promulgating uh, information that is, you know, extremely questionable at best. In other words, purported government documents that don't have an official provenance where Quite literally, a uh, researcher gets an email with what looks like a government document that has tantalizing information about UFOs, and they're lecturing on it and putting it out there saying, look, I have this government document. Well, until you can verify the legitimacy of that document, you shouldn't be doing that. Or if you are, at least put it out there with uh, you know, certain caveats that, look, I can't guarantee the authenticity of this document, but this is what it says. But you have many researchers that, you know, do like to sell books, do like to focus on the sensational, and they put that what I call spurious information out there. Or they'll they'll use that as the linchpin in their argument that, you know, there's this great, great conspiracy or there's this fantastic tale I'm going to, to lecture on and write a book about. Um, I think that, you know, uh, the argument for the existence of UFOs and how we're looking at it and approaching it it's only as strong as the weakest link. And when you use information like that, or if you're citing someone that is known not to be credible, yet you're taking what they're telling you and running with it, as it gets repeated and told over and over again, it becomes fact in many people's minds. And so I don't want to delude myself. I don't want to delude my audiences and anybody that, that knows me, and I'll have lots of personal friends that can attest to this at the conference this year, as I do many years, they will tell you, you know, I try to properly vet the information to the best of my ability when I'm presenting it. Uh, unfortunately, many people, many UFO researchers don't do that. And it's ironic because those same researchers, in a sense, are spreading disinformation. At the same time, they're blaming government authorities for spreading disinformation. Nice. If you're not going to vet your information appropriately, if you're not going to verify, and in some cases, tell them, look, this information is not valid. If you're out there spinning it and telling it to audiences, you're doing what you're accusing the government of doing, putting out disinformation, misinformation. All right, David, great. Uh, thanks for that. I appreciate it. And uh, so uh, um, if you're ready for question answers, uh, might sure. as well start now. So again, if, if there's one that you just want me to skip over or not sure about, just let me know. We'll move on to the next one. Um, sure. This one is from uh, Robert asking uh, greetings, a question for you guys. Have you guys mm -hmm. experienced successful CE5 events? What do you think about CE5 and all the video evidence throughout Facebook and YouTube? I mean, the CE5 is, is definitely interesting. Um, I haven't engaged in that area of research myself, but I know there are some credible individuals that are doing that. 
Uh, in fact, uh, there was a gentleman that reached out wanting to talk to experiencers that I felt were credible, and they were actually going to be working on some experiments with regard to CE5. Uh, I, I don't have any any uh, detailed information regarding that project. But again, as I alluded to, whether we're talking nuts and bolts, abductions, CE5 events, I think it's all important. And I think one, th one comment I made to uh, a researcher recently was, it doesn't matter what you study, whether we're talking about the confines of UFOs or outside the realm of UFOs, uh, including CE5s. It doesn't matter what you're studying. The only thing that matters is your research methodology. If you're looking at something in an objective way, in a standardized way, and uh, you're honest with yourself and looking at the data, I think you can study virtually anything. And the CE5 is certainly one of those that is highly interesting and highly unusual, but I personally haven't uh, engaged in it myself. Great, thank you for that. Uh, the next question uh, would be from Niels, and he's on Telegram, so he'll ask it himself. Uh, Niels, you are unmuted on my end. Unmute yourself on yours, and please ask your question. I was just wondering if you wanted to uh, for me to talk with CE5. Well, I'm sorry, we don't, Niels, we don't have time for that right now. Do you have a question for David? Uh, what are the star people, uh, are they going to intervene in, uh, if the world goes to war? Uh, can can <laughs> well, you speak on that? Uh, I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have any, any way of having insight into that, but uh, I, I don't think that, uh, and this is just my own personal view, I, I don't think that they're here to save us. I don't think they're here to destroy us. But, you know, I've always felt like w observational in nature and th they're watching a society in its relative infancy, to be quite honest, uh, seeing how we develop and seeing how we interact with each other. Um, there's been many, many other wars where they haven't intervened. And so... I, I don't hold out hope that there are saviors, uh, as I know some people believe. I, David, I think um, that. Hold on, quick. You, you, uh, you cut out again. You said some people believe, and then oh. you, you cut out. Oh, some people believe they're here to save us. I, I don't necessarily subscribe to that. Um, I think that uh, they're here observing. Uh, and again, looking at other wars that have taken place where they haven't intervened. Uh, it seems like they're interested in every facet of our society. Unfortunately, one that seems to be predominant in our history is warfare and conflict. Hmm. And so uh, I could be wrong, but uh, I think that they're here observing and watching the red ants fighting with the black ants, so to speak, if I can use the insect analogy. Right, right. Great. Thank you, David. And Niels, thanks for your question. Uh, the next question Thank is from Rune. R-U-N-E, asking, what was the earliest triangle sighting and what's the latest? Oh, great question. Um, the earliest one that I have, which has been referenced in my book as well as elsewhere, is 1882. But once I was able to obtain an original copy of the report, it was actually 1881. So I was off by one year. My apologies. Uh, that was actually in a Scientific American edition, which I have an original copy of now. Uh, and it described astronomers... Uh, seeing two black triangular notches moving over the lunar surface or in front of the lunar surface. And uh, this was uh, discussed and uh, recreated quite well in the Smithsonian Channel uh, TV show uh, that they did on UFOs. And we did an episode on triangles. Uh, that's one of the earliest accounts that I have that is fairly detailed. Uh, again, the further you go back in time, the less detail you seem to have in many of these narratives. Um, the most recent, uh, I, I haven't kept up on the recent ones so much because I've been so focused on the history, uh, would probably be the latest ones reported at the National UFO Reporting Center, which uh, usually, they usually lag about a month or two to get those uploaded. But, you know, I'm sure that there's there have probably been sightings and reports in North America within just the last week alone. So this one, just to because uh, um, this kind of would answer a question for many others too. Uh, this is also from Rune. Um, usually, I try to get as many people as possible, but this one is pretty good. As simply saying, um, "Hi, this isn't a question, but I have a clip of a UFO you might find interesting to me. Uh, it looks 
uh, wedge-shaped, standing still in the air and rotating. Uh, it was filmed in Sweden, 2018. So, do you have do do you um, do you encourage people to email you or no uh, regarding some some videos or some information that they have? They they can certainly. I, I do preface that though by stating I'm not a photo or video expert. Uh, I don't include photos or videos in my lectures for that very reason. My area of expertise isn't photo analysis or video analysis. I do have individuals, though, that I can call on if there's a significant video that someone sends me and have them look at that. But I would certainly love to see that, you know, if you'd like to send that to me. Uh, I, I'd l certainly like to see that. Quite often, though, I get uh, photos or videos and people will tell me it's a dramatic uh, photo or video of a triangle. And it's a little black dot that's seen for maybe half a second on the video. <laughs> and I right. thought many of those, well, that could be an insect. I, I don't know what that was, but <laughs> uh, but I would certainly like to see that. Uh, I, I don't think I'm familiar with that one from Sweden. You know, um, this is just a, a selfishly asking a question of myself. Uh, regarding the conference itself, though, you've been going for, you know, there for many years and you know what the environment is roughly. Mm -hmm. Have there been some people there that um, kind of gave you, I guess, like, um, I don't know, just like, uh, uh, like something like, wow, this person truly is what they say they are. Let's say that they are in connection with governments or specific uh, agencies and all these other things. Or uh, do, does everyone just kind of seem like they're full of it because they just talk about you know, uh, everything and anything. Because if you attended the conference, you know how that is. Everyone will, I mean, my very first conference in 2012, and this was before even Dolores took took the, um, um, took it over. It was so funny. There's a guy in a trench coat just running around and he would just go up to people, hand them a card. It says, free ride off the planet, free ride off the planet. You know, I was like, awesome. I'm at the right place. You know, and thankfully knowing that this was just an attendee and the speakers ended up being spectacular. And, you know, which yeah. also Reminded me in 2012, I'd like to find out this person that talked. Um, they they basically said that this was their last time that they would be speaking publicly because of at the level that they're at, they're going to be having a, a classified um, a, a deg degree or classification um, or top secret or not top secret, but another level of security to where now they cannot do conferences anymore. And some videos huh. that they showed was very interesting. So, uh, hmm. and I believe they recorded this. So I might during the conference or maybe a bit early, I'd like to at least be one of those people and send you this footage. Not, not, um, you know, cause this was like 2012. I'm not saying that CGI could not have been at play, but the way sure. he was describing what he said he knew. And when he, he then showed this footage, it was like, man, this is really something, you know? And he was basically claiming that this one particular video was a test flight, uh, because, um, and, and he was saying that they have to still do it slowly because they haven't figured out some, um, you know, that, that gravi gravitational pull. So if they did like a immediate 90 degrees, they'll turn into a pancake in, in within the ship itself. But anyway, sure. there's something I want to send you and, and they will, it, it'll have their name. It'll be funny if it's actually that T, TR3B guy, but it seems like this so sounded like, uh, you saw him speak earlier than 2012. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I was actually at, I was a speaker in, uh, 2012 at, at the conference. And so I know it wasn't Edgar Fouché, uh, but I'm trying to remember which speaker that Ooh, might have okay. been. Okay. Well, even uh, better. I'm sorry that, that I forgot about that too. So I, yeah, it was, uh, I'll look up the listing cause everything after 2000, 2013 is when Ozark has names and files and things like that. Everything before that was handled by sure. different groups. So, I don't know if they have videos out. I hope it's it's available for at least purchase think, or be received somehow. Yeah. I think I might actually have all of those on DVD, so I could sort okay. of work with you. We'll try to well, at least if, if if anything, just if it's not too much trouble, if you can like just hook me up when when we go to a conference, I'll be more than happy sure. to pay you for your copy. You know, no, because absolutely. you know, I'd love to just uh, that aspect of just to know who that person was because probably if they didn't have a website, if they really didn't take over fully, because they immediately handed it over in 2013. So I don't know, you know, who ran what and, and where it could be. I'll probably have to Google the hell out of it just to maybe find something. Well, go, going back to the conference for a minute and just the, the, the level of people that are there, uh, it was actually speaking in 2000 on this January 5th, 2000 case I referenced earlier uh, in stepping off the podium 
and stepping down from the stage, a gentleman came up to me immediately after that and presented his business card. And he was my friend, Richard Taylor, who worked uh, for the FAA. And he said, Dave, if you need assistance with radar data in that case, he goes, I might be able to help you. He goes, I, I helped install the radar systems at Lambert International Airport in St. Louis. Oh. <laughs> and so it was as a result of speaking on this case that about uh, four or five weeks or so after that, I was in the control tower at Lambert International Airport talking to the air traffic controllers about the UFO subject. And I always mentioned that that was, as you can imagine, one year prior to 9-11. So, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't have been able to do that a year later or two years later, but prior to 9-11, security was very laxed and I was able to go right into the control tower with my friend Richard, who they knew. And so you never know who you're going to meet at these conferences or who's attending. And beyond the conferences itself, just in the last couple of years, uh, I've had a uh, gentleman contact me, not tied to any government project or anything, but I do uh, local radio here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I live. And I had a caller call in and he said that he was a retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force and he would love to come to my research center and see some of the original Project Blue Book documents. And about two or three weeks after that, we were able to finally coordinate our schedules. Not only did he come out, a retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, he brought his best friend who's a retired colonel in the Air Force, who happened to be in charge when he was active duty. He was in charge of uh, advanced weapons development for the Air Force. And mm. here I am sitting in my research room behind me at the conference table, and I have a retired lieutenant colonel and a lieutenant colonel, and we're talking seriously about the UFO subject. And I bring that up for, for a very important reason. Uh, when the Pentagon UAP report came out, people were somewhat disappointed that it didn't have much information or it lacked detail, etc. But as a result of that, more military people, active duty or retired, are coming forward and approaching people like myself and others in the UFO field. For the 30 years or 31 years leading up to that, I never had an active, active or retired lieutenant colonel or colonel in the Air Force contact me voluntarily to say, I'd like to sit down and talk UFOs with you. But as a result of that UAP report coming out, the culture of silence has changed. The culture of skepticism has changed. These people feel more emboldened to contact me. Another one that contacted me was out of uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And I believe, if I, memory serves, he was another uh, retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. And he contacted me and stated, much to my surprise, and by the way, I, I did a little investigative work and I did verify he is who he said he was. Um, he stated that, I just want to let you know, continue the research you're doing. I'm following it now that I'm retired. I've been following your research on these triangular UFOs. And I know a number of other retired and active duty military who are also following your research on the subject. So... That was some incredible validation for the work that I was doing coming from an individual like that. And again, I did verify he is who he said he was uh, you know, after he had initially contacted me. So the point is the, the nature of the dialogue is changing where we are getting very serious people, uh, retired or active duty military or intelligence, that are engaging with researchers like myself and others and having that dialogue. And... Um, it's just, I think it bodes well for the future. Uh, again, I've said it before, the more brains and sets of eyes we have that are looking at the subject and collaborating, I think it just, it, it really bodes well for the future of ufology. And all those you just mentioned, are quite, uh, you know, quite the connections to have. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I have a, one last question for you before we um, uh, finish up. But uh, again, I need to interject one of my own. So um, I'd be remiss not to ask it. So what what did they tell you? I mean, what did they give you some pretty uh, eye raising information? Or was it just that, you know, they're, they're finding that, yeah, there's more validity to this too, from the uh, military governmental point of view? Yeah, they didn't disclose any sens sensitive or classified information. I'd love to tell you they did. I wish they would have, but <laughs> and right. even if they did, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't have said that they did. I don't want to get them in trouble. But no, in, in all honesty, they, they didn't divulge any secrets or anything of that nature. They did infer, though, that during their time in the Air Force, they had heard about reports. They had talked to other people that had had sightings. And they basically implied that, you know, in fact, at one point, 
they were being very cryptic. And I asked the colonel, the, re the retired colonel, I said, so UFOs, real or not? And he looked at me and he goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> he goes, they're real. And so, and that's what's interesting is for people like Chris, Christopher Mellon, who, you know, much of your audience, I'm sure is familiar with, with Chris and his work on the UFO UAP subject. The thing that you have to understand in dealing with these people, uh, I always say that the conversation is usually a one way street. I can tell them what I'm finding, what I'm researching, what I'm investigating, and they're keenly interested in it, I can tell you. Um, but I can't ask them what they know because obviously they're bound by security oaths, secrecy, non-disclosure agreements, et cetera. So I understand that going in, and I think that's why I've been successful in garnering some of these uh, military and intelligence people wanting to talk to me about the subject because I don't put them in an uncomfortable position asking questions that I know they can't, a that they can't answer. Right. Yeah, you definitely maintain their trust. Um, so David, last question from Hazel, uh, she's asking in your opinion, which ufologist has the most truthful information? Ooh, that's a really good question, Hazel. Wow. I got to think on that one a minute. <laughs> uh, wow. That's a really hard one. Um, cause as you know, there's popularity and there's credibility. The two don't necessarily right. go together. Right. I can think of some popular researchers, but I wouldn't necessarily say they're credible. I, I will go to my default answer on that. Uh, I'm sure there's some other ones I could think of, but the one that I will tell you that I have relied on, that I've respected, uh, is Jacques Vallée. Uh, and I say that because I have verified some of the information, some of the cases he's talked about, some of the French cases. I've recently acquired some French periodicals that touch on some of the cases that Jacques Vallée wrote about in his early years. And I verified the information through those sources as well as foreign researchers. But I also trust and respect Jacques for one very important reason. He's postulated different theories on, on the UFO subject and the nature of the UFO subject. I've respected Jacques because he's never gone down the pathway or one might say the rabbit hole of belief. Uh, quite often, researchers that get into the subject, they're objective, but over time that objectivity erodes and you find yourself falling into the trap of belief, which then skews your objectivity. Jacques, to my knowledge, has never ever hung his hat or his coat on one pet theory. He's put forth a number of them, but he concedes that we can't be sure of anything with regard to this UFO subject. And as I wrote in my book back in 2013, and I still say this today, despite having lots of data, data doesn't necessarily equate to answers. And there is no shame as a UFO researcher saying we don't know. And I, I kind of question those researchers that think they do know the answers to the UFO subject. I, I often liken it to religion. If you've got that religious leader tell, asking you to send in your money and he's telling you, I know what God wants of you. I always tell people you need to run the other way. <laughs> and same holds true with UFOs. If someone tells you they know all the answers to the UFO mystery, they know why the aliens are here and they know how how you fit into that whole framework, run the other way. It's it's the researchers that I respect that say I don't have any answers. I have some insights and I have some data I'd like to share. And that's really where I fall. Uh, I'm going to share a lot of information and uh but you know, there's a reason we call this the UFO mystery. It's still a mystery. Right. Well, David, thank you for that. So just in conclusion, I want to give you the, the last word to just uh, finish off with whatever it is on your mind that you would like to leave the audience with. Well, uh, I'd just like to say that, uh, as we've touched on already, I started attending the UFO conference in Eureka Springs. I believe it was 1991 or 92. And I have attended off and on since then. I started lecturing there in 2000. Uh, not to sound like a paid infomercial or commercial, but uh, it is truly one of the best UFO conferences in the country. And I just don't say that uh, based on the presenters. I say that based on the people of Eureka Springs, Arkansas. They make you feel so welcome and at home. The landscape is beautiful. But truly, uh, you know, the conference organizers have done a wonderful job of presenting really a, a stellar lineup of presenters and a stellar uh, venue, really. Um, and <laughs> at the detriment of insulting myself and my fellow presenters, 
<laughs> yes, I, hopefully you'll learn things and you'll be entertained attending the lectures there. But I'm here to tell you, if you stay up late at night, you learn so much by just talking to other people from other parts of the country and establishing the network because truly there's people from all walks of life from all across the country that attend this conference. And it is truly one of the best conferences hands down on the subject. Well, there you have it. David, thank you very much again. I really appreciate it. Um, in the description below, for all of you watching, um, I have um, uh, David's uh, link to his website, um, also a link to his Amazon book. And I certainly always hope that uh, any guests that I have on, that you guys check him out and uh, support him in any way possible. Also, um, again, the link for the registration to get your tickets for either live streaming or in person is in the description below. So. Long story short, everything is in the description box below. <laughs> so, uh, David, thank you again. I really appreciate you taking the time. And um, I always, you know, I'm excited when somebody could answer questions because people, you know, always have questions of their own. And many times when somebody says, oh, I was late or whatever, I'm like, you should have written it down or put it in your calendar because <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> well, I look forward to seeing you on a personal note, and I look forward to seeing as much uh, as many of your audience members as well, hopefully in person, if not virtually. Yeah, me too, because I know I'm probably going to be meeting a, a few of them. So it's always, it's a, it's a first one really for me, you know, for someone like, hey, I, you know, watch a show. I'm going to be down there. I'm like, awesome. You know, let's meet. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, um, everyone else watching, thank you all very much. Uh, David, thank you again. And uh, tune in next time. Y'all take care.